Hello, I'm Joshua Chambers, the founder of Gov Insider, and you're joining us for the Gov Insider Live Festival of Innovation. Today, we are looking at new models of government, and we have an incredible lineup for you today. From Poland, we have joining us the Deputy Director of GovTech Poland, Anthony Wright. From Lithuania, we have Aruna Makeliti, the manager of GovTech Lab Lithuania. From the United Kingdom, we have Andrew Greenway, founding partner of Public Digital. And originally from Estonia, but now a professor at University College London, we have Professor Reina Cattell, the Deputy Director and Professor of Innovation and Public Governance at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College London. I'm incredibly excited for the presentations that you're about to see. If you're watching this on Facebook Live, please feel free to push share and share it to your audience. Otherwise, if you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to subscribe. And I'm going to hand straight over to my friend Andrew, who's going to kick this off. Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Josh. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, I am just going to share my screen. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to see some slides um, as I'm going to talk through uh, this afternoon. Um, so um, I'm here wearing two different hats, um, both as a founder of a consultancy that works with lots of different governments all over the world, but also as a former public servant in the UK. Um, and I think the first thing to say on this topic is when it comes to new models of government, um, there aren't that many new stories under the sun. Um, new technologies maybe, new politicians, very much so, but often it's the same skeleton of government underneath. So any new model of government worthy of that name has to go quite deep. Um, this isn't really something you can just sort of buy off the shelf. And I really think that at the moment we have a very interesting moment in time, possibly a window of opportunity for thinking quite differently about the structure of government. Um, Coronavirus, I think, hasn't necessarily changed the, the bigger forces acting on public sector organisations that much. But what it has very much done is sharpen the importance of those trends that were already there and accelerated the need for all, all organisations to start adapting to them. And there's been a great deal of talk, I think, in recent months about new ways of working having appeared um, within governments all over the world. Things like greater agility, working across those traditional boundaries, greater collaboration between the public sector and the private. And I think to some extent that can be a little bit overstated. Many of these patterns are actually seen quite frequently in governments in times of crisis when new ways of working are essential. And what's quite interesting, I think, to me is the sort of the more old fashioned traditional structures of government allow for that higher level of functionality and always have done, but as a safety net for quite extreme times. But often governments are not set up to sustain those ways of working for extended periods of time. And I think it's also quite interesting that amidst, amidst the pandemic that we've also seen some of the anti-patterns of more traditional governance and ways of working within government that have been quite familiar for some time. Technology and technology and IT based programs are often still a source of political embarrassment, often because senior figures, be they elected or, or public officials, have, have lacked the awareness or perhaps the confidence and knowledge to ask the right questions before they dive in. Um, We've also seen technology being put forward as a bit of a shortcut, um, a route to some quick, easy fixes to wicked problems. And things like contact tracing apps, for example, which have been launched in various guises all over the world to quite a lot of fanfare and often quite significant cost, have often actually delivered relatively debatable utility in quite a lot of jurisdictions. A friend of mine had describing contact tracing apps as sort of the blockchain, the current blockchain of digital public services. Um, and what he means by that is that it can be a slightly overcomplicated idea that might be delivering more heat than light. And it's attractive to politicians because it's an announceable thing and often easier to do than some of the hard yards of deep service design. And something that links, I think, those two themes of, and two anti-patterns, if you like, is a degree of codependency that exists um, between the public sector and consultants. Rather too many governments have outsourced their brains and often other significant body parts and at quite great cost. Um, now, consultants, I think, do have their place within this ecosystem without question. And clearly I'm talking to you as one. So I have a view on that. 
But I'm very passionate of the belief that those, those consultancies cannot and should not be charged with creating new models of government on their own. And quite often that thinking is being done outside the core of public service. So many of these issues, I think, have been long been suffered by the existing models of government. Um, and those models have been put under se severe strain in recent months in responding to the coronavirus pandemic. And I think one of the things they're grounded in is the basic shape and structure of government in vertical line ministries who are often quite keen on protecting their own turf rather than working collegiately behind the collective vision and sense of accountability. And those models can be sort of decades or even centuries old and beget quite a hierarchical culture that moves at the speed of process rather than the speed of trust. And so kind of coming back to today's question with what would you replace that old shape with? What, what would a new model of government look like? And I kind of thought back when, when sort of Josh and team posed this to a piece of work that I did with the think tank Nesta last year. Um, they invited me to write uh, a document based on a sort of top program they were doing around radical visions for government. Um, and the exam question they set was, was what could the UK civil service look like in 2030? So I had a go at writing a version of the Northcote Trevelyan report, which is up on their website if you fancy a look. And the Northcote Trevelyan report was sort of the founding document of the UK civil service. It was written in 1854, um, which makes it 166 years old. And despite its age, it probably represents the last successful attempt at a genuinely new model of government and civil service reform in the UK. And I had a go at writing the equivalent from today's perspective. And the thing that I landed on as the single most important organizing principle, the thing that really actually gets stuff done in government, wasn't technology or incredibly smart individuals or process, it was teams. Now you see teams very often in government, but they tend to be defined by their department or their discipline. You'll hear talk about the economists or the IT department. But what I mean is teams with flexibility, multiple disciplines, the responsibility and the ability to work, walk to work towards a common goal without seeing grades or who came from what department. And that's not a particularly complicated concept, but it's quite a hard one to execute. And there are lots of teams like this all over the world. I work for one in the government digital service in the UK when I was a civil servant. This slide that I've just put up is a team based in the government of California who led the online response for their government to COVID-19 and ship new web-based services and information in hours and days. And the things that characterize that team were they were agile, they were diverse in every sense, they were empowered by their leaders to make decisions with the people in the room rather than going through lots of boards, and they were outcome focused. And again, that's not a complicated thing, but it is hard to execute. And there are lots of teams like this all over the world, and the more of them came together in the pandemic response. But sadly, I think some are already beginning to dissipate. And the thing that unites them all, as well as some of those concepts that I've touched on there in terms of their diversity and their drive and their degree of engagement, really is this. They are relentlessly and ruthlessly user-centered. Um, there's a sort of a phrase that sort of suggests that every bureaucrat is an outsider and every bureaucracy set apart from its people. And the teams that I think drive new and successful models of government are counter that view. These teams are not. They're very, very closely attached to the citizens and businesses and others who they are delivering for, rather than getting sucked into the internal needs of their organization. So for me, it's going to be user-centered teams that will be the organizational units of government in a new model, not individual generalists who might be brilliant on their own, or indeed ministries as a unit of government. Teams are going to be the building block of the new model of government because actually they've always been the building blocks of delivery when it matters most. They might be a blend of public servants and contractors, but the difference is there will be high performing, cross cutting, cross disciplinary, and that those teams will be created as a rule in normal times rather than those teams just emerging by exception, driven by crisis. And just before I finish, and there's a sort of inevitable question around this which is won't having lots of autonomous teams working like this just lead to chaos in an organization as big as government. You can't have hundreds of teams going off and doing their own thing. And that's a fair enough challenge. One thing it does ignore, I think, is that every government already has hundreds of different warring teams who are sort of going off and doing their own thing anyway. But either way, if you're gonna build a government around teams, those teams will need some guidelines, so an organizing framework of sorts. So I think the kind of future model of government is one of coordinated decentralization. 
So these empowered teams won't be coordinated in the traditional methods of government by rules or processes or by strictures, although there'll clearly be elements of that. But instead, they'll be bound together by some common components built by a central team for use by all and iteratively improved upon. And accountability will also be spread more widely to more people to reflect the fact that there are more autonomous teams. And those common components will be various different things. They might be things like design systems and design patterns to make sure there's a consistent look and feel to public services. They might be common digital platforms for utilities like payments or identity assurance in the session earlier. They might be common trusted data sources. So there's a single version of truth that all of government can draw upon. Equally, they could be shared physical office space or pools of highly specialized talent that various teams draw upon. But that idea of more distributed accountability can only happen with the right organizational rules and incentives that are in place. And new models of government, I think, will have to look closely at some of those underlying things that shape incentives within government, the funding of projects, how public servants are rewarded to attract that diversity of skills, backgrounds and experience, and at how procurement processes give access to public contracts and solving public problems to the widest possible group of qualified suppliers. And I think, and I'm sure we'll touch on this later in the discussion, we're already seeing lots of steps towards that on many fronts and in many countries. But I would say, in my experience, that no country has cracked all of those things yet. Uh, and I believe there's a great prize for the government who gets there first. Thanks very much. I'll, um, I'll pass on to the next panel member. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that excellent presentation. A uh, real rock and roll presentation, no doubt, inspired by the guitars right behind you. We're going to go straight on to our next presentation, which is from Lithuania. Aruna Mataleti, who's the manager of the GovTech Lab there. I'm really excited by the GovTech Lab. I've been seeing it coming up more and more online recently. So now we're going to get an insight into what it does. Over to you. And hi all, thanks for having me here. Um, as I mentioned, I am the manager of GovTech Lab in Lithuania, and today I'll talk through the GovTech Lab as one of the new models of government and how it works and why why we need it. Um, very shortly, GovTech Lab is a team in public sector that connects public sector tech challenges with innovative teams in private sector that can help come up with the solutions. And although uh, some institutions have been experimenting, on, experimenting already in Lithuania with different ways of uh, coming up with the solutions. GovTech Lab is an attempt that was started in 2019 to kind of bring this approach to a wider network of institutions. And it's actually great to be here because uh, when we we're creating the lab, we consulted with GovTech Polska and Public Digital on you know what kind of values we should build it on, how we should structure it. So it's definitely very nice to be here uh, on the same stage today. So to start with, you know, why why did we even need the lab and why we started creating it? So we saw that the traditional approach, uh, where the public sector defines the challenge and the solution it needs, and then contracts the private sector to develop, deliver it, rests on the assumption that the public sector has the monopoly of knowledge around both the challenges that it has, solutions uh, that could be built, while private sector is capable of autonomously creating the solutions. Um, so this situation kind of led to, to, to a situ this kind of led to a situation where the main quality in the supplier the public sector is looking for is stability and not innovative ideas or out of the box solutions. And while this might be effective for very simple problems um, like buying notebooks or computers, um, it does not work with complex challenges. So what we saw what we need actually is not contracting out, yeah, these kind of ideas and solutions, but co-creation of them. Um, so, and what we see here in Lithuania that two main conditions had to be met to kind of ensure that we actually can create a public sector that reflects 21st century, uh, both the technological advancements and the citizens' expectations that they have. So firstly, we need to empower public sector officials to experiment, look for, for out of the box solutions, and, and most importantly, trust in themselves and in the process of that innovation hunt. Uh, because what we see if they keep questioning, you know, can I look for, for a different solution? That's not gonna work. They have to trust in the process and in themselves. And at the same time, we need to ensure that there are some, there's someone to co-create with, right? So we need to diversify the players in the private sector that can help coming up with, uh, with the solutions and then creating them. 
So we need that means that we need to create a conditions for smaller companies, startups to participate in all this process of solution creation. So having these in mind, that was kind of our basis for why we created the GovTech Lab and also the aim of the GovTech Lab to fulfill these uh, two different conditions. So as I mentioned, uh, GovTech Lab is a team of public sector around uh, five people now and we officially started uh, at the end of 2019 although like some of the initial activities and piloting of of different uh, functions have started before and we focus on three key areas um, one is matching GovTech challenges and ideas then accelerating GovTech teams in the private sector and building GovTech community in Lithuania and this is both uh, from the private sector perspective so ensuring that um, people that have ideas around building GovTech startups could find each other and meet each other, but also from the public sector perspective, so that, that we have people in different institutions that you know have that desire to look for out-of-the-box solutions so they can uh, meet each other, find each other, and ensure that you know they kind of uh, keep each other motivated um, to, to find these uh, different ways of working in the government. And the main activity uh, that connects all these areas is GovTech Challenge Series. So it's actually the, the process that connects those public sector challenges and innovative teams that have ideas and solutions for public sector challenges. Um, and GovTech Challenge Series is uh, formed of four stages. So first we work with public sector institutions to define and select the challenges. Uh, once the challenges are selected, uh, we have an open for for an idea of how to solve a challenge or for example if someone already has a solution um, simply submit it and once we have all the ideas we select the most promising teams and work uh, together through structure accelerator and accelerator not only for the teams in the private sector but also for the public sector so we want to make sure that um, teams from both kind of sides work actually together and cooperate and provide you know workshops together so that both um, private sector can appreciate how the work is being done in the public sector, but also public sector sees, you know, what's, uh, what's the perspective from those uh, startups or, or other companies and you know what's important for them so they can actually find a common ground and common language that can speak with each other. Um, so we provide all the expertise, you know, that they need in, in creating these products. And then we move to implementation where public sector institutions make decisions uh, around their procurement. Um, we help the teams uh, to commercialize the product beyond this challenge and we want to make sure that they get as much as they can from the process in terms of scaling their team and their solutions. So we're currently on the second round and the second iteration of our GovTech challenge series. We have 10 challenges that are waiting for ideas and actually the deadline is um, this Friday. So if, you, uh, if you're a GovTech startup that kind of wants to create a solution, uh, please feel free to to submit yours, but some of the challenges that we've uh, we defined, and they're, um, some are more social, some are just related to internal processes. So we have some, for example, detecting and safe products on the internet, or helping monitor um, hate speech on the internet, improving access to public services for people with hearing difficulties and similar challenges. Uh, so definitely kind of have a broad range of, of more social and related to like that citizen um, interaction also with internal processes like for airports we have a challenge in how to track the like automate the tracking of all the planes in the airport instead of doing it daily as we do now. So um, at the moment the challenge series is actually then there's a pre-procurement uh, pre stage um, so that public sector institutions could figure out what they need to buy. But of course, we as a, as a GovTech lab, and when we see the situation, we want to do this experimentation and have conditions to do this experimentation within public procurement frameworks, um, because we do see the value of actually kind of investing in these solutions and providing more incentives for teams to come up with the, and like work together to create these solutions. Um, so we've been trying to convince public sector institutions to actually use the same method as GovTech Polsk is using. I'm, I'm sure they will tell afterwards a bit more about that. Uh, that's called the design contest. Um, but hopefully, um, hopefully from, from now on, we won't be able to do that much of a convincing because Lithuania government just approved the 7 million funding to uh, for pilot um, to pilot innovative solutions in the government. Uh, so if all goes well and the decision doesn't get lost in all the corridors of bureaucracy, 
uh, will be able from, from our next GovTech Challenge series, provide the funding from the very first stage and kind of um, uh, this make it make the GovTech Challenge series both more safe for, for public sector institutions, uh, but also for the, the teams that participate in it. So that's kind of the main thing that we do. We also try to help institutions organizing discussions with suppliers before procurement, if we have capacity. But uh, but the kind of the main values and ideas that we try to follow are first the, the co-creation that I mentioned. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that the challenges are both defined working with a, with a with a society, with the people that are affected by those challenges, and then that you know the use of that uh, tool that is created um, is actually consulted when created when then used kind of consulted with the participants. So for example, last year when we had the challenge with Bank of Lithuania about how, about how to automate the sharing of data between financial market participants and the regulator you know the, the desire for that tool came from the fintech community itself and then now before starting to use it on the scale bank of Lithuania is consulting the full kind of uh, all participants of the financial market so that they can know uh you know if they're actually gonna use it um secondly um the uh, the second value is that open innovation that i think will be important very much in the kind of that new uh, models of government and governance. So we try to encourage uh, public sector institutions to be open about the challenges, to not pretend that everything is great and you know, that they can solve everything behind closed doors. And at the same startups to share their ideas about the solutions. And we acknowledge that you know, there are inhuman risks about sharing uh, some ideas before you actually build the product or patent it. But we think that that's kind of the only way to create both a vibrant community um, a GovTech community in Lithuania, not just a supplier tool, a supplier pool. And for for the government, that kind of, I think, uh, would help to also move to what Andrew was talking about very rightly about that working, not based on just your one function, but actually uh, building everything around teams and being open, not just being close to one kind of vertical, but being open to uh, different, um, different perspectives and seeing the, the topic that you're working in from a both uh, kind of from different angles and having that teams of like multidisciplinary people. And we think that these kind of ideas that we try to bring through the just one process can help them, them and kind of uh, change the culture a bit in the public sector as a whole. Thanks a lot. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that presentation. I've got lots of questions that I'm going to be asking you straight after our uh, presentations. We have heard from Lithuania and we just heard also in that presentation that some of the work being done there has been inspired by GovTech Poland. So it's fantastic timing that we can now turn to Anthony from GovTech Poland to talk a little bit more about your mission and what you're doing over there. And I have to ask you to take yourself off mute. You are currently muted, Anthony. Thank you. I, I do apologize. Uh, so I hope you do see my slides now. Mm. Uh, so it's really more of a sort of inspirational deck than sort of the, the main um, thing I wanted to convey. But uh, in principle, uh, as uh, Arun said, as uh, and a, as some of the watching may uh, recall, uh, we are the GovTech Polska, also known as Government Technology. Um, oh, I do apologize for that. Um, that what, that's what happens when you don't turn night mode on. Uh, I do apologize. Anyway, uh, so. We are a uh, multidisciplinary task force in the Prime Minister's Office of Poland. Uh, we deal with basically everything which uh, you know, has the word innovative, uh, digital. I'm sorry or... to interrupt you, Anthony. I'm so sorry. Um, we don't sorry. have your slides currently on screen. Um, oh, you don't. Stick with us for a second, folks. But um, could you just push screen share, please, Anthony? Yeah, we're quite keen. Yeah, to... I do believe I, I've done that, but uh, I will do this in in a second of course um my apologies maybe andrew can uh, play us a song while we're waiting yeah trust me it's in everyone's <laughs> best interest that i don't <laughs> <laughs> 
Right, so uh, you just see myself, right? We can see you currently, we can see us all, and then in a second... Um, Right, so I'm pressing share screen and bring screen. up the slides. It should I work. Just did that, and then I actually did the whole screen. Uh, I know. Do you see anything now? Perhaps. Oh yes, we do. Yes, we do. Lovely. That's great. Uh, all right. So uh, apologies for the uh, the delayed start. Uh, as uh, as I was saying, as some of you may recall, uh, we are a um, the Gothic Polska, which uh, those uh, viewers and readers uh, who are Singapore-based may uh, know. Sort of organizationally, we're very similar to the the Singaporean Gothic, which it means sort of we do operate under the PM, sort of with a cross section of government uh, in terms of uh, digital projects. Um, so, uh, without further ado. Uh, so the larger thing that inspired us to sort of uh, come up with uh, this idea of you know, doing something sort of off the beaten track uh, is uh, this one number, which uh, we found really staggering, uh, seeing as uh, you know, this, this number on the left, 400 billion, uh, this is our yearly budget of the entire Republic of Poland. Now, uh, over half of this, uh, over 200 billion, uh, is spent each year on procurement. This is literally the largest market within the entire country. Uh, so uh, obviously a lot of value here. And uh, as um, Andrew was saying, sort of the more value there is somewhere, then there is the more uh, potential for change and improvement. Uh, and uh, therefore, we decided to sort of give it um, a shot to uh, see our um, uh, to, to direct our focus over there. So, uh, you know, why is is this whole thing happening? Why uh, is this an issue with uh, smaller companies not being able to participate in in public tenders? Well, I mean, you know, those reasons here are listed, but uh, principally uh, they all sort of uh, trickle down to uh, you know, excessive bureaucracy, really, sort of. Uh, the government not speaking the same language as this innovator community uh, within both Poland and uh, other countries. Uh, so uh, we set out uh, to build an alternative, uh, a different model of a government which actually speaks the language of the people it's supposed to govern, uh, especially the innovator community. Uh, now, so the third thing we started with uh, was this sort of massive you know, pie chart you were seeing. Uh, you know, this, this issue of uh, you know, SMEs and the startups really not having too much access to uh, large government projects, which is a massive pity because over 97% of global companies are startups and SMEs. So, uh, you know, the potential is really obvious uh, here. Uh, whereas this sort of proportion in terms of the companies who actually do get uh, a public contract is literally reversed. So um, obviously, you know, a lot of a lot to be done here. Uh, as Aruna was saying, so I, I won't delve too deep into this. Uh, design contests. Uh, it basically means that uh, there's a public institution uh, which uh, sort of sets out uh, a challenge, which then uh, is uh, easily implemented by uh, SMEs and startups. The one thing which differentiates it from uh, other sort of initiatives, which aim to accelerate or promote uh, SME involvement is that this actually is a legal procurement um, you know, way, which uh, means that the public institution is actually able to sort of purchase the last thing that uh, won the contest, which is of course uh, you know, a massive advantage for, for them because there's no sort of tendering and purchasing procedure uh, as a follow-up. Um, you know, we build software tools for this. We sort of have the whole suite of um, of uh, tools we we sort of would like to showcase, but that's probably the subject of another discussion. But in principle, sort of these three things are uh, what we believe to be the differentiating factors between uh, you know, the interesting public sector challenges and what you can see in the private market. Uh, so you know, projects are small but interesting. Uh, there's sort of no uh, excessive prerequisites going on. So literally, if you're not um, a convicted felon, you're more than eligible to take part. Uh, there's sort of no uh, you know, tendering requirement or uh, loan capacity or anything really of the sort. You just you know, present us with your solution and we'll take it from there. Uh, and obviously, you know, there's just one uh, set of government data and it's owned by the government. So obviously it makes the, the project way more interesting. Uh, you know, 
numbers, I think, do speak for themselves. Uh, that is just to give you um, sort of a benchmark here. Uh, normally, uh, a, a, an ordinary public tender across the EU uh, has about three participants, and uh, I think we average about 50. So there is really sort of our guess that there is a massive potential in the startup community to supply technology to the public sector uh, wasn't entirely wrong, it would seem. Um, but obviously, that's not all. Uh, uh, you know, more is expected from us, and we try to deliver more uh, each each year and each time. Uh, when last year, uh, the uh, Justina, who's now the Prime Minister's higher representative for for GovTech, um, you know, attended uh, this 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 conference in a physical fashion. So we're about at this stage. So we're introducing this part, which I'm showing right now, um, without going into too many details. You know, we, we thought that we should go a bit one step earlier with uh, to sort of not just technical solution but also ideas for areas of for improvement uh, so uh, we organized massive massive server design sessions uh, about you know Polish rail uh, about water in Poland uh, and then the government of Nigeria decided to approach us about yeah that's actually a cool idea uh, any chance you could come over to Lagos to, to implement that in, in, in Lithuania. And well, lo and behold, uh, you know, before we really noticed, we were in Lagos doing the exact same thing. So uh, you know, we're really trying to export those, uh, those solutions, adjust them to a different perspective which other countries have, which means we learn a lot uh, and hopefully others do uh, as well. Now, uh, obviously uh, the elephant in the room here for everyone who deals with digital policy uh, is the pandemic. Uh, you know, there are online memes circulating all around the planet with you know, who uh, was responsible for a company's digital transformation, uh, and uh, you know, not the CEO, not the CTO, not the CIO, but COVID-19. Uh, and you know, it was also the case for, for us, uh, and we really had to step up with different sort of means of uh, engaging uh, people to provide digital solutions in a very, very short time frame, because obviously, Know, the people who are unable to uh, sort out their their basic needs um, physically due to the pandemic, uh, and they we had to come up with a digital alternative. Uh, it wasn't easy, but we also got a lot of help. Uh, you know, the, some of you may know this already, but uh, the Europe's largest hackathon and world's second largest uh, is actually held in Warsaw every year, uh, which uh, allowed us to hold a virtual edition of this. Sort of get the, this this community involved, uh, you know, much deeper into developing solutions, which uh, aimed to. The first hackathon was uh, combating the pandemic itself. The other one was uh, about combating the economic impact of the pandemic, and the third one was about uh, sort of getting back on track the the economy and the society. Mm. My apologies for the Polish text on the article. It just uh, sort of the um, the sort of the main one we we had about the the issue. Uh, the second one, uh, as uh, you may know, in some other countries also happened. Uh, remote education was a thing. Uh, all schools closed, uh, and we had about a week to come up with a way to um, to, to you know, for students, to, students and teachers to cope with this. To switch about twenty thousand schools to remote education, obviously a massive challenge. Uh, effectively, the, we ended up with about fifteen thousand implementing this sort of involved uh, uh, sophisticated online learning tools, which uh, we believe is is a success, um, uh, but hopefully it won't be needed uh, ever again. Uh, and our last uh, brainchild, uh, the fake hunter, which um, you know, uh, obviously there was the pandemic, which is health emergencies, but uh, there's also this, uh, it's a new term, but we really do like seeing it, the so-called infodemic, which meant um, you know, basically a spread of misinformation around the internet. Uh, so what we did, we launched a, a portal, which uh, allow, is a bit different than other fact-checking websites because uh, it's not exactly sort of send us an email and we may get back to you with a report. Uh, we try to sort of get uh, you a feedback within hours uh, if, if need be. Uh, there is a dedicated plugin, so you just you know, literally uh, highlight a text in your browser, you press submit, and then we have to take care of, of the rest. Uh, the, the one interesting bit, which uh, I will bring you to my conclusion very shortly, is, um, you know, again, this is sort of involving people in, in government because there, there, there were a couple hundred volunteers uh, who decided to get involved with the portal and uh, combat misinformation with uh, their skills, knowledge, and time, which we found was absolutely amazing, seeing as uh, you know, 
it is estimated that about uh, 600 people died due to the mis uh, COVID-19 related misinformation. So really sort of, it's not a um, an abstract challenge, it's something very real. And uh, if we can contribute to preventing it even a slightest bit, that's, um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do this. So um, no, I know uh, you're probably looking at me in a scornful fashion. Uh, so we can just conclude with, you know, if anything of this seemed interesting to, either uh, my, my esteemed colleagues here or anyone in the audience, you know, this is our email. Uh, we, we, we're always glad to um, get in touch with uh, other governments, uh, you know, exchange information, exchange experiences, uh, share some of uh, our remarks about uh, what's going on. So uh, again, we're always open for cooperation and uh, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, because what we want to prove is that this work does not exist in government. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. And I've got lots of questions coming up for you. But first, we're going to hear from Professor Raina Cattell of University College Thanks, London. Josh, Raina, Thanks over to everybody, you. Thanks for everybody who has uh, spoken so far. I think very interesting and very intriguing presentations and um, I am of course not a practitioner so I can't share my practical experiences as, as you all are good so I'm uh, uh, by definition almost talking slightly more about not about perhaps sort of the new models that we see emerging but I think more about perhaps challenges that uh, those new models should try to solve I think so I think there is a uh, I mean I'm sure many of you you know the famous quote by Barack Obama, who said in 19, I think it was uh, 2011, in the State of the Union speech, when he said that the last reform of government, at least in the U.S., uh, took place in, in the in the era of black and white TV. And I think in, in many ways it is very true that we live in governments, um, most of us, I think, that are that look very similar 100 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, maybe even more. But at, at the same time, of course, it's also not pretty really true because if you look many governments, I think, particularly in the West, have undergone major, major reforms over the last maybe 30 years. And I think this is what Andrew was referring to as well by the rise of consultancy, for instance, and outsourcing and also all these kind of managerialist reforms that really try to see, you know, government as a private sector. And I think this is something that when we're talking about new forms of government, we're still reeling from those reforms. And if, if you have followed the uh, the news from the UK, for instance, around the COVID and, and uh, uh, tracing apps and, and testing uh, debacles. These are all the results of uh, of this kind of loss of capacity and hauling out of the, of the state. So that th I think there is a, yes, obviously, uh, there is a need for you know, new new forms of government, but at the same time, of course, we have had a massive uh, reforms as well. But I think um, there are like a couple of um, really important things we have to realize about government when we think about new forms. And first is that, uh, you know, if there are things that governments have created 2000 years ago and that are still in use. So if you go to North Africa and Morocco, you, you still find public bath uh, that, you know, bath houses that were created by Romans 2000 years ago, and they're still being used as public paths for the, for the, for the purposes of public health. So there's just something that 2000 years old. So at the same time, of course, governments have to also deal with COVID-19, which is something incredibly immediate. And so you need to have this sort of both deal with something that's extremely long-termist, for instance, our pension systems, uh, or something that is ex extremely immediate. So I think this is this makes governments unique that you that you need to build both for the long term but also for the extremely short term. Uh, so this is something that that governments really need to, and also the new 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 models of government need need to be able to do. I think the other thing is that you know if you go back uh, over the history of of government, at least over the last couple of hundred years, um, you can see that there is a, uh, this, you know, debate between centralization, centralization and decentralization. I think this is again something that that Andrew was talk, uh, addressing as well through the idea of teams. And I think there is a this really interesting balance between what, what centralization offers you and what decentralization offers you. And obviously, uh, this is something that also the new forms have to have to deal with. But I, what I want to specifically talk about is, well, I think there are like three major like misunderstandings or, 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 or tensions that we need to address when we think about new forms. So first is about the idea of capacity. What is what is the capacity in government? What does it mean to have capacity in government? The other is uh, digital. 
uh, what, what we mean by digital when we do government. And, uh, and the third one is uh, who is government for, or who is the user, so to say. Uh, and so that's, uh, these are the three things I want to bring to the debate. So first, if you look at the idea of capacity, and I think this is what uh, uh, I think in COVID is uh, most clearly you can see that, yes, we need agile and dynamic responses, but those responses are really relying or on resilient and long-term structures either in health, um, or, but also in fiscal policy, but also in digital uh, infrastructure and so on and so forth. So if you look at the like, successful uh, COVID responses, they were, yes, they were very agile, but they also relied on, on long-term capacity. And I think this is something uh, that, we, that we really need to understand better, how agility actually rests on resilience and, and long-term uh, capacities. Uh, and, and all also the other way around so if you don't have resilience in your system uh, your your sort of agile response to crisis becomes just sort of a panic as we as we can see in, uh, in, in, in a couple of countries so i think the governments you know new 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 models of government if you will need to be able to build capacities for long-term investments into health systems into education systems but also into production systems for instance but then also need to develop those dynamic capabilities to be able to respond to both uh, changing needs uh, from from citizens, but also to the crisis like we're, we're experiencing now. And I think the really really the question is, you know, so what is the balance between looking for a long term, stable, predictable things and that capacity? And what is the you know how much do we need to go towards the agility and, and dynamic capabilities? And what do we need to have in house as government? And what do we need to uh, work with private sector uh, together? And what can we outsource if anything? And, and how can we that done in a, in a sensible way. So I think this sort of balance between long and short term in a way and what kind of capacities build in house and how to build them is a, is a really big challenge. And I think we heard some of those from, from the cases of Lithuania and, and, and Poland, I think, which is really interesting, this idea of co-creation and, and the idea of dealing with uh, procurement principles. And so the second thing I want to talk about is the sort of misunderstanding around digital, our attention around uh, digital. So I think there's a um, a lot of the digital government efforts end up actually working towards having more efficient government, just sort of saving money and bringing the costs down. But I think we don't really ask what is the other value we can actually create. And I think if you look even like very different examples from, from Estonia or UK, for instance, you have a very different digital governments, but they sort of end up being eventually about how can we bring costs down, which is, of course, it's, you know, it's, it's a wonderful idea. But what else can we do? I think you know, looking at only at efficiency, uh, we are sort of really playing into this big tech uh, talk, which you know they are they are the same thing. They are providing us with seamless services. So you know, if you know, and we are we are sort of falling into the trap. We think that government should be as seamless as Amazon, and that we get into this uh, sort of very utilitarian state-citizen relationship because you know this. Efficiency uh, implies that I don't want government to be anywhere near me. I just want the government to send me a notification when my passport is, is about to uh, expire and I just renew it, which is great. But I, mean, I think we want more out of this relationship. So I think the way, uh, the really the challenge for a, for a, uh, for a digital government uh, functions, if you will, is how do we actually engage citizens? So if you think about local planning, city planning, so, you know, we all, you know, Whenever we go out, outside after this session here, we, we will leave data trail along the streets, but you know, we don't really own this kind of data. We don't really deal with this data at all. This is owned usually, at least here in, in the West, by, by private companies. And I think this is a, a, we lose this critical relationship between government and the citizen. And I think the second thing is that we are really have forgotten that governments are, and that is, I think the Poland example is a great example. Here is government really is a, is a shaping markets to procurement really in a massive way. So we should really think of government as a, as a, a, a you know the one who can create you know innovation ecosystems in many areas, uh, especially through procurement. I think the GDS example in the UK and Poland example that we just heard are really interesting examples. And I think the last thing why I want to mention is uh, who is the government for? Who is sort of so to say the user? And I think here again we have like two is juxtaposing ideas, if you will. One is we come from this mass production of services, so mass production of health, mass production of education, and we look at the citizen through the lenses of averages. So if you if you look at the, 
a typical sort of public service. It is great for an average person, but of course nobody is average. And and so we that's why we we look at those services like hospitals and things like that. They're so expensive because they're so large scale because they are serving the average. And then the, on the other hand, you have this idea of, of bringing in new types of uh, methodologies to government, like user-centric design and all those that tend to be very focused on very individualistic. So I think something that we have forgotten is something in between is, is this idea of community and that we are all actually social. So nobody lives alone, no man is an island, if you will. And I think that this is, uh, I think we, we saw in, in the Lithuania's presentation so, so nicely, is this idea of how do you actually engage and co-trade with citizens. And again, this is something that we should also think about how do we actually, you know, provide evidence for that as well. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was a really thoughtful and insightful presentation. And let's go straight into the questions now. First, I want to talk a little bit about skills, a little bit about HR. Andrew, I remember a conversation with you I think last year in a coffee shop somewhere in the world where you were talking about a new idea of HR and how you measure and how you train people to work in government. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think one of the interesting things, and, and Raina touched on it in, in sort of mentioning digital, is that w digital and digital transformation has been a big topic in government for the last sort of 10 years or so. And it's sort of effective if you want to press it in a very glib way. It's sort of bringing IT and technology out of the plumbing layer of government and up to a more strategic position in a kind of a more elevated discussion. And I kind of think that the next one or oh, next big kind of element that would happen to this should happen to is HR because government's fundamentally a people-based business and always will be and always has been. And yet the kind of the conversations about HR and organizing people within government tend to be very transactional and quite dull. So I think given the importance of teams and, and sort of that greater porosity, I think that, that Anthony and Aruno talked about between the private and public sector, how do you reframe HR and managing of people in government to kind of encourage that diversity of expertise and experience and background. And one of the ways I think, and one of the questions that will come up in new models of government is, why do you sign up to be a public servant? What are the benefits? Well, they tend to be a fairly similar package around the world, right? You tend to have a bit more job security. You tend to have a better pension maybe and more holiday. You tend to have less pay than your sort of private sector equivalents. And that as a package is sort of what you get. That's, that's the deal for everybody in public service. And I think that works very well for certain individuals given a certain risk appetite or given a particular stage in their life or their career. But it's not gonna work for everybody. And I kind of speak to a lot of younger public servants who would say, well, actually, I'm less interested in the pension. I'm quite prepared to work very hard, but I quite like to be paid a bit more. And kind of introducing some of that flexibility into sort of how public, what the public service contract is. Um, would I think be quite interesting and one of the elements that, that makes it less about blending contractors and public servants, but also having more of a mixed economy of public servants themselves. And it's really interesting to talk about HR. I actually wanted to go to Raina now and, and ask a kind of follow up on that because you're talking about younger people, but actually we've got an aging demographic. There's a whole pool of very wise former public servants who are able to work, who are still keen to work in some ways, who want to play their part and have a role. How can we, when we're building these new models of government, look to ensure that we actually draw on that wisdom of people who are still around and willing to work? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really good question. And, and uh, I think that Andrew was um, saying something that's really, really important. I think this, this idea that, that we have this monolithic career, basically, is a, linear path, uh, career path, I think is is something that's probably not really conducive for, for today's government or future government. And I think what I see is, really, is a really interesting idea is this idea of, of managing or, or running a, a community of practice. And I think this is where digital units and governments are very good at actually design units because they are they're really used to working with uh, soft, in, you know, engineers and designers outside of government because they have their own meetups and whatnot. And, and so it's a really useful way. And I think this is what, uh, what other governments areas can really learn from these units is how do we, how do we manage a community of practice around health, for instance, or around procurement practices or around anything else. And, and so I think this is something to make it more of an open in terms of people coming in and out, but also ideas coming in and out. And also the, you know, what do we call evidence, for instance, in, in government as well, this, this being much more flexible and amenable, I think that's really important. And let me also ask you about COVID-19. 
does that again change our thoughts on what kind of models of government that we require? In your mind, has COVID-19 shown any strengths or weaknesses that need to be addressed or need to be built on? Yeah, I think, as, 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 as I said in, in my brief remarks, I think there is COVID has really, said, in many ways, it has shown the, the importance of government, the value of public actors, but the value of somebody who can, you know, when the music stops, so to say, can really actually start again. I think this is something that, that was proven uh, very, very strongly. But at the same time, also this, as I said, this very dynamic response this ability of governments to say that yes we can take on very long-term debt for instance and we can really look into the you know next 50 years of our spending and at the same time we can also run out like testing uh, kits uh, for tomorrow so i think this is a unique balance that that governments will i think increasingly need to face if you look at climate emergency for instance i will if you, if you think about 20 years in the future many of our areas where we are living will be under under serious problems, either from the population changes, climate emergency, but the both really, again really need this kind of very long-term vision, but at the same time act now. So how do you balance that? I think it becomes a super interesting challenge for governments. And, and there are already units and models that are shaking up government. Aruna, we heard that one of the roles of, um, of your lab is to, in quotes, shake up government, something that you noted. So when you've been shaking up government, how have you ensured that it hasn't uh, prevented you from being able to do it, hasn't stopped you from doing your job? How have you overcome any challenges you may have faced while doing the shaking? Or is everyone on board with what you're doing? I think uh, unexpectedly, actually, more people were on board than we thought that they will be. I think there's still, especially in, a, in smaller countries, there is that desire to kind of find uh, you know, flexibility, your competitive advantage, and and it's easier to sell new ideas. So um, I'm pretty sure that you know, for Andrew to set up GDS, that was way, way harder than in Lithuania, you know, when you have way smaller public sector, way smaller kind of that, like, um, there's not that many traditions in how the public sector is run and, you know, there's still, uh, because, I mean, there's, you know, 20 years past or uh, more than 30 years past, but, like, there's still not that many forms of uh, traditions and ways of working. So that's way easier to break those ways of working where they're not that entrenched into the system. So but I think just that, to follow uh, up, you did note also that government often wants stability as well yeah. that was a function that you said that you were addressing yeah. so how do you shake up that uh, stability that coziness and make sure that people are kind of pushing at the cutting edge i think before before covid not now like one of the uh, although maybe that's kind of a boring answer but just be getting like people different people in the same room uh, that was very much like very useful in terms of just you know getting different people to talk and then seeing, you know, that the public servant and public official is not like, I don't know, it's, you know, there's no like public sector as a well, whole, right? There's just people there. And it's the same with startup. It's not just like uh, hipsters running around and, you know, uh, doing their own thing, but it's actually people that have expertise, that have ideas. And I think when you show that kind of, uh, you know, on the in individual level that, you know, create that connection, then it can be transformed to like way wider structures. But I mean, that wasn't easy as well and um, before, and it's still, I mean, we, f we tried to find uh, those kind of uh, the, the most innovative, uh, both teams and, and people in the public sector that could speak for, for us as well and kind of through in their institutions and in their departments that understand the value of innovation. Um, but we, of course, we still struggle like to convince, uh, especially to convince public sector institutions to do something when that involves procurement or money. You know, if it's if it's outside the, the framework, if it's... Um, if it's more than just an experimentation at the beginning, of course, that's easier to convince them. But like, um, I think it's just like a few cases of, of success that helps a lot as well. It's just showing that, you know, if someone already had like done that, if someone already has uh, worked on that, that's very helpful. And this is where I guess the, the Polsk example, the GovTech Polsk example mm -hmm. really helped us as well, just to show, you know, okay, they're already doing it. They did like 20 challenges or something. You know, we follow the same EU regulation, like we can do that as well. Like you not trust the you know the market that's way bigger than us. Um, so, you know, like these uh, 
the success stories not only from within the government Lithuania's government but also like from around uh especially from the neighbors but also from like um scotland like civtech team in scotland uh, um uk catalyst all these different teams that like their examples helped a lot in convincing I mean, maybe that's a desire of a small country to have the approval of, of a bigger neighbors uh, and they kind of inherently trust their their processes. Um, but that helped us a lot. Fantastic. And that leads nicely into a question for Anthony, because we've heard about the, uh, the successes and the importance of success stories. But something that really struck me in your presentation as being frankly amazing is that on some of the projects, you have no tendering requirements, you said. As long as you don't have a criminal conviction, that's it. Come and pitch to us. And there's no process. You just get to come and pitch and, and then sell your solution directly to government. That sounds fantastic. Presumably, there's a reason why over time government has built up these incredibly long and sometimes almost fossilized tendering requirements. What risks have you seen when tearing up all of the rules and how have you overcome those risks by, you know, saying no tendering requirements whatsoever? What have you done? Well, I mean, to clarify first, I mean, as Arunia was saying, we are all bound by you know eu law and there are certain the boundaries within which we can take a sledgehammer to all those uh, no rules and procedures so i mean we, we can smash a window or two but not the whole condemnation that's basically the uh, the the metaphor here so uh no i mean it, it's actually quite the opposite so uh, what we try to do is you know we try to separate the actual requirements which you know obviously are there for a reason and you know have been built over ages of, of, of work and uh, and uh, some thoughts presumably went into that. Uh, so we tried to separate those and obviously we kept that uh, from uh, elements which are sort of um, imaginary problems, perhaps uh, some somewhat um, psychological or procedural, but would generally do not seem to serve an actual purpose. Uh, so we actually tried to, it's actually quite in the reverse um, than, than what uh, some of the, uh, the viewers may, may uh, have inferred from my presentation. So we actually do not um, sort of, we did not try to dismantle the law in the reverse. We actually, uh, are sort of, this, the model we tried to create was uh, designed explicitly in order to fit within the legal framework rather than sort of go at the side of this box. And, and there's a very simple reason for that. Uh, obviously, you know, we could just set up a contest which would do exactly what you said, you know, everyone come on, come ahead, pitch, pitch to us, you know, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do something with it, I guess, at some point. But uh, procurement and tendering is not this simple. And in order to give the public institution the reassurance that, you know, this is an actually legal procedure, uh, I think the, this was the largest chunk of our, our work, really, uh, to sort of make sure that whatever we're doing, uh, we're doing within the legal framework, and uh, we're sort of following the, the ground rules we're actually following. But in terms of the risks you mentioned, obviously there are you know, many. Uh, it's much easier to uh, contract to a large company, this is the usual suspect in terms of tendering, uh, than to contract a startup. And this is an inherent risk, though. And I think even if the actual, the worst thing that can happen really is that the contract fails and you have to start over again. But you know, this is not this big of a penalty now, is it? I mean, uh, you know, the, the odds here are you know, about 80% that it will entirely succeed and 20% you know, that we'll have to do it again, which is also fine because we'll, this whole procedure is also about two to three times shorter than the actual tender, which you know, we end up being sort of the expected values we actually be. Uh, be quicker. So uh, there are obviously risks, but uh, that's kind of embedded in the definition of innovation. So uh, we're tr not trying to run around, run around with a sledgehammer, but we're trying to sort of do it in a precise fashion to separate what we actually have to follow and what makes you know, actual sense from what's psychological and procedural. Fantastic. That's the spirit. What a, what a wonderful approach. Um, let's, let's finish up with a round robin question. Often these panel discussions can focus a bit on challenges and obstacles and negativity, reasons to be cheerful. So I want you to tell me one thing in government that's really exciting you at the moment. Andrew, I'm going to start first with you. What's a reason to be cheerful? Uh, I'd like to come back to something Aruna said, which is, I think, it's very telling that countries without perhaps, uh, with younger institutions, can move incredibly quickly when the stars align. And I think COVID has given a real window of opportunity to do that. So I think there's an opportunity to build on some of the successes 
um, that have gone before and moved quite quickly. And, and fantastic, Aruna. Let's go to you. I think um, talking about COVID and just expanding what Andrew was saying, like the crisis showed the the potential of the public sector and the the motivation of people that are working here to actually you know fix your problems and work on them. And so I think that kind of the, the hopeful message is that if public sector wants, they can do it. It's just now for the bureaucracy to catch up to all that work that the public uh, sector officials have been doing. Fantastic. And GovTech Lab Lithuania is a brilliant reason to be cheerful in its own right. Anthony, a reason to be cheerful, please. And you're on mute, I'm sorry. Apologies. Uh, so you know, this whole fact that we're having the discussion here, was a, we, those are actual issues which actually impact the government and the government is open to them is something we probably most people I talk to would not imagine you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. So uh, the fact that we're this online for a government network, uh, at least I'm connected to it, means that you know, it, we're actually embracing new technologies at a rate which is similar to the private sector. We, should, we have nothing to be ashamed of here. Fantastic. Thank you. Reina? Yeah, well, I find really exciting, I think, today is that there are so many people who are, who are willing to question the form of capitalism we are now in. And so there, I think this is, a, this is a good sign for, for, you know, inequality, climate change, all of those issues that maybe we're actually able to, to tackle those issues. And sounds like a topic for another panel session in its <laughs> own right. That's all we've got time for with this panel session. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciated your time. Thanks. And that's the end of the Gov Insider Live Festival of Innovation for today. But join us again tomorrow when we have an incredible lineup of global speakers for you, starting at 10 a.m. GMT plus eight. That is uh, 10 a.m. Singapore time. We have Canada. We have Singapore Smart Nation. We have speakers from right across the world coming and talking about data and transformation. The World Bank joining us as well. And that's the first session that we have kicking off an incredible final lineup to our festival. But that's all we've got time for now. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again soon.